My name is Nazli Kebria from the Department of Sociology here at Boston University, and I'd like to welcome you to our session two uh, on people. And uh, we will go in the order uh, that's listed on the program. And our first, so our first presentation is on expats by Judith Yappe from National Defense University. That will be followed by a presentation on youth by Mehdi Samati from Northern Illinois University. And finally, citizenship and rights uh, by Farhad Kazemi from NYU. So thank you and welcome. So we'll begin with uh, Dr. Yape. I am here to talk about the others in the Gulf. Those who are non-middle class, uh, they have no political, um, economic, or social status as such. They are insecure. They are unseen. Guess who, who are we? <laughs> it's almost like a game. Uh, what I want to do is, um, I actually thought of a title just about 10 minutes before we started, ready to start. And I think it's something that like this, expats and oligarchs in the Gulf. It will build on much of what you've heard in the first panel. I would like to set the scene. Uh, talk about what's changing, talk about the status and role of the expats. It's not as simple as we all like to think. Uh, and we have some very interesting examples of what might happen. Better put, what has already happened to those who are expats in the Gulf but suffer the whims of political fortune. I'm thinking about the Kuwait War. Uh, I'll talk about how the Gulf states deal with um, these issues. Let me start this way. As I said, um, the sheer number of expats in relation to the populations, the national populations of the Gulf states are very troubling. Go to the, f go to the, uh, the first. This is the total of expat uh, expatriates in the Gulf. And if you look at that, you'll see something is missing. Uh, but you probably won't be too surprised at much else. Expatriates constitute greater than 50% of the population in all of the GC states except for Oman and obviously Saudi Arabia. Saudi's expat population is greater than any other in the, in the GCC. Now these expats, they build the tallest buildings, clean the houses, tend the children in the gardens, cook the food, wash the dishes, serve in the restaurants and hotels and things that we won't speak about because they are taken advantage of. It, it, it is an abusive system. Uh, there are too many incidents of that. They also build the tallest buildings, or I think I, I got there already. They're far from home. They're unable to see their families and their spouses. Um, they also, the money they send home keeps families together, villages alive. I don't want to exaggerate. It even has a major effect on countries' economies, which we could see in 1990 when there were expulsions, and I'll come back to that again in a minute. Um, they lack protections afforded citizens, uh, preferred foreigners, they have no unions, no places of worship, few skills. You get the idea. Before Saddam invaded Kuwait, this is the big watershed, if you look at expats, conditions and the Gulf states, um, before then, they were Palestinian, Jordanian, Yemeni, which means they were also Lebanese. Um, I think Iraq had the largest, had over a million Egyptians at one point. All gone. Since 1990, since Saddam's invasion, all of this has shifted. They are, if you, as you can see here, they are mostly, uh, the largest group comes from India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, which uh, has a uh, large percent in certain, in certain countries. There is another, um, there's a chart. Is, is, there, oh, is, is there one thing before this? Or maybe um, it's not on there. Or, no, okay, go so. to the end. If you can go to the end. The end? Turn it backwards? No. The, whoa. Or no. Oh. Well, you never mind. Like, oh, go, back, go back to the second one then. Now go, go to the next one. This breaks it down by countries, Bahrain, um, uh, Kuwait, and the others. Now, most of the, these statistics all come from official sources, mostly from um, Arab sources. But I have, a, I have a long memory. I started working on the Gulf a long time ago. And I seem to remember different numbers. And maybe I'm wrong. 
Uh, Bahrain looks right to me. Kuwait is now back to where it was before the, they were invaded, at which point they said, never again will we be so dependent on foreign labor. They are more dependent now. There's more foreign la expat labor there now than there was before Saddam invaded. Next. Got it. Okay. Saudi Arabia. Uh, if you look at the numbers of Indians, Bangladeshis, Pakistanis, very few Yemen. And only, it's only in Saudi that you'll really still find Yemenis uh, working. Uh, not many Filipinos there, but you get an idea. The next one. Uh, now, it's Qatar, and after this, the UAE that I had questions about. To my memory, both Qatar and the UAE are 87.5% expat labor. In other words, one eighth of these countries with a small, small, po this is probably the smallest populations, have the highest percentage of expats. Okay. Yeah, that's the UAE. Again, mostly Asians. This, oh, no, go ahead. The pie charts, I have such a clever research system. The pie charts give you an idea. The red total, uh, the red is the foreign population, the green is the native population. I think we're in the ballpark for most of them. Anyway, uh, the shift that was so striking and part of it in 1990 was until that point, um, again, Palestinians, Muslims were the majority of the expat population because they could be trusted. We They shared values. Um, they were more like the countries. After that, they were the ones you could not trust because they were Muslim. They had betrayed the countries uh, by, uh, by supporting Saddam's occupation. And that support came from Yasser Arafat, so the PLO was persona non grata. The um, Salah supported Saddam, of course. More than a million uh, Yemenis were thrown out of Saudi alone. 400,000 Palestinians were thrown out of Kuwait, uh, the largest Palestinian community outside Jordan, Lebanon, uh, et cetera. Um, only 25,000 were left at the end of the Kuwait war. And I don't know that many of them have gone. I haven't seen that they've gone back. And I, I get out there once in a while. Um, now, again. The non-Muslims could be trusted because they were not Muslims. They didn't carry any radical political or religious ideologies. Now, change is afoot in the Gulf. I know people have been saying that. It's been stable for a very long time, but I think we're in the middle of a, uh, several kinds of uh, shifts. Amirs have declared themselves kings. Everyone is rushing, not so qu not quickly, <laughs> I used to say at a glacial pace. I think the glaciers are melting faster than some of these reforms here. Uh, but they're setting up cosmetic parliaments. They're talking about allowing the vote as if that would make a difference in decision making or in politics or level the economic playing field. So they talk about reform. They talk about allowing the expats to change jobs. And they talk about offering protection against rapacious contractors. But in reality, people who are tracking us say they don't really see much, if anything, happening. Uh, there are demands for political reform. There are demands for uh, an end to ethnic and sectarian discrimination. But they don't come from the expat community, which knows better than to draw attention to itself. But they do come from the uh, disadvantaged, from the poor, from the workers, who may see who see in some cases that the expats take away jobs. It's not simply a thing of they're doing jobs we don't want to do. Some of the, you know, not everybody in the Gulf is rich after all. I, I don't want to give you the idea because in the past few years we've seen some kind of startling things for the Gulf. We have seen political demonstrations against the regime, demonstrations for economic reasons, better jobs, less discrimination, do they involve the expats or not? I think it almost doesn't matter because they bring with them, it's believed, uh, or certain ideas. They, they could, if they chose, and they don't choose, to represent an element of instability. I don't, they're not there yet. This is not the major problem. There is the potential to frighten the oligarchs of the Gulf. Um, but what I want to look at, I mean, this dependence is going to continue. But again, to come back to examples of what has changed the dynamic, 
I talked about Saddam's invasion of Kuwait. There have been other examples as well. Um, 2009, hundreds of Lebanese Shia were expelled from Kuwait because they insisted on holding commemoration rites for Imad Mughniya, the slain uh, terrorist. And they uh, allegedly, a lot of them had ties to Hezbollah. Who knows? But when it's in question, you, you move them out. Uh, there was also um, deportation of Palestinians last year from the UAE because they wouldn't identify to security forces Hamas. So they had to go. Bahrain has, made, uh, has a problem with expats. It's, it's a reverse problem in the sense. Um, there is, as you probably all know, Bahrain is what, 25% Sunni, ruled by the Sunni Arab family for about 200 years. 75% of the population is Shia, most of it Arab, uh, some of it Persian. But the point I want to make is the Shia are getting much more engaged. Uh, there is, if you want to call it an awakening or what, but there are a lot more protests and civil rights and human rights uh, organizations, and they're angry because they see a reverse of this expat. It's not an exodus. They're coming into, they're being, uh, that, that Arabs from other countries, Sunni Arabs, are being invited, encouraged to come into Bahrain, are being given citizenship and jobs in the public sector, especially in security. Uh, and the goal is, in effect, to change the demographic balance so that it's more like what Bahrain officially likes to see. And I think it's the official statistics here, I think, is that it's, what, 40% Sunni? Where's Bahrain? It doesn't tell you there. It just says, as opposed to foreign. But there's no way it approaches 40%. But this attempt to change the demographic balance has, it, is uh, raising an increasing level of protest there. Then there's the Yemen. What can I say? Everyone's following the Yemen. It's the crisis du jour these days. Um, and the solution is supposed to be solved by opening up the Gulf to Yemeni workers, Yemen labor, once again. Now, I said there's 600,000 roughly in Saudi, but if you look at the figures, there are very few, in any, if any, in um, the other countries where they, there used to be quite a few. Part of the Yemeni's problem, of course, has always been totally unskilled labor. But the point here is that after 20 years of political pariah status, they're still pariahs, uh, outside the GCC box, thinking and waiting that they'll say the magic word and get in. I don't think they will. Uh, but they're almost certainly there. Um, in a sense, the solution, everyone says, or the people in think tanks at least, you Saudis can solve this problem. Open your doors and let them in. And I think the Saudis and the Gulf uh, Arabs have been very clear in their response. We don't think so. They bring things that we don't know what to do. We're still angry for what happened in 1990, but also they'll bring with them the taint or the seeds of religious or political or sectarian extremism. Take your choice. They think that all of those things are possibility. Uh, they would prefer the Band-Aid solution. You know the parable that, uh, that if, you, if you have a hungry man and you give him a fish, he has a meal. But if you teach him how to fish... You give him a job, he can feed himself. This parable has not yet hit this region, I'm afraid. And I think that the older attitudes and the sense, the, the sense of mistrust still pervades. Now let me just give a uh, few points of all of this from the expat side. And you can all disagree with me if I'm wrong afterwards, but I think, I think some of these are pretty true. Expats have the potential to exert significant pressure, right? demographically, economically, and socially. But whether real or imagined, Gulf Sunni Arab officials see a threat. The threat that they see is from religious and sectarian groups, most of which are national. Uh, they see it over time. Um, they have a hold over the expats that they don't have over their own populations, and that is that they're easily hired, they're controlled, they're easily fired and deported for misbehavior. Um, I don't think they really worry about the disproportionate demographics between national and foreign populations. A much greater worry is that among the nationals themselves. 
The expats have the potential to pose an internal security uh, threat, and I think that was a greater worry during the recent recession, which I'm sure is gone by now, and Dubai can now build the second tallest building uh, in the world, but who builds that building, right? <coughs> oh. You can sit down. I don't think we're going to need... We've kind of gone over... Yeah, okay. Uh, the security apparatuses, is that a word, apparatuses? The security machines of the GCC states are sufficient to curb, I think, any significant unrest, at least in the short term, probably even in the longer term. Expat populations also serve as sort of a playing card. And this is where I was thinking about our conference a couple years ago, Farhan. There are, <coughs> excuse me, this whole question of uh, the labor coming from the Asian countries, but investment does not go back into them. What goes back into these countries is, are the remittances, but there no, there's no equivalency in terms of financial investment in those countries that provide, uh, supply the expats. If somebody has different statistics, I would love to hear them. What I have seen, though, suggests the opposite. What I'm remembering from that conference were the comments made by, made by several um, Gulf businessmen was, um, you know, we do like the, the cheap labor, you know, the inexpensive labor to be polite, but we are going to invest our money where we think there's the best return, which at that time was the United States, Western Europe, you know, all the, the not Harrods, let's buy Harrods because that's a good investment. It's all about profits. But the expat thing can be a playing card if you want better relations, for example, uh, with India, which, by the way, has started to play a more active role in saying it's going to protect its, its nationals, uh, especially from the uh, people they contract, so that their conditions are better and they are protected. Um, anyway, um, the other point I would make, that there are clearly important differences in class and culture, which hit the expats very hard. Um, they are kept separate, really, from society. Uh, Omanization and Saudiization, and I don't know if, if the word is Kuwait, is, I can't say it, it must be Kuwaitification. In other words, the hiring of nationals into the labor force uh, has been going at some pace, but that's mainly in the uh, trained and skilled brackets. It is also true that a lot of the education, the expectations of national, uh, national labor uh, are much higher than their skills very often. So expat labor is still preferred in many states because it is A, either more skilled, or B, willing to do unskilled work cheaper and can be easily fired. Um, the other thing I would note that some of the oil-rich states, oil is not labor-intensive. I'm thinking in terms of states, if this is the Gulf, I, I know uh, five minutes, how could that be? All right, let me move on to my, I'll move on, that's okay. Forget, uh, forget the rest. Let me just go to my conclusions. Conclusions are always a good thing. Here's some conclusions. <laughs> Time goes so fast when you're having fun. Uh, as I said, the GCC countries will remain dependent on foreign labor so long as it's cheap, abundant, and manageable. Uh, the expats from Arab and Muslim countries are still seen as potential carriers of infection, the infection of extremism, the infection of uh, radicalism, whether it is uh, republicanism or uh, tribalism, well, tribalism is there, but in a different form, sectarianism, uh, al-Qaeda-style terrorism. Unemployment is not a key factor in producing recruits among the expat populations. That's a problem for the, the native populations. And I don't think that this really intrudes, uh, the one does not necessarily intrude on the other. Remittances seem to, be re to remain positive. They have gone down with the economic downturn, and some have, have been forced home, but not enough to suggest that it's a major problem. And if the economy is coming back, then it's probably stabilized. Uh, the GCC states have taken modest steps to labor reform, uh, but there's no transparency, and enforcement is weak, which says that these policies are more talk, 
to appease perhaps a foreign audience than to really have impact inside. Uh, there's a slowness in implementing reform. The sponsorship system persists. One of the changes, though, which is coming is that at least uh, expat laborers will be able to change jobs once they're in country. Uh, and they will get their documents back that cannot be held by the, con the, the uh, employer necessarily. Uh, but it has yet to be operationalized. Um, I think the real question is, uh, it's not that these countries are ever going to be able to nationalize their labor force. I think it is more a question of uh, providing perhaps better benefits, if, if they provide any benefits. But it's, it's a problem which I think they see as far down the road. I want to make one last comment, and that is how we look at this. Very often, people who look at the problems of the expatriates, and for any of you that have been out there, there's my last sentence, for any of you who have been out there, I, I think we are more struck by it probably than anybody else because we see this through our eyes. We see it through Western eyes. And we think that the solution would be they should all have a hope for what? The equivalent of a green card, the equivalent of the right to become uh, nationalized at some point, the right to have their families with them, uh, which only the very well-to-do or the special have the permission. But uh, part of the problem there is that we tend to see it in terms that we deal with uh, legal and illegal immigration here. And I think that's probably not the way to look at this because we are dealing, uh, dealing with the cultures out there. It's not that everybody would like to be uh, nationalized, maybe they would, but I think it, it makes the issues more confusing and doesn't really help very much. Finished. Thank you. Hi. Uh, um, let me start by thanking uh, Professor Norton uh, for uh, the invitation and uh, other colleagues. Uh, we thought it would be a good idea to have someone from uh, the field of communication in your midst, uh, because that's uh, my area of, of uh, expertise. Um, so um, when I say I am going to address youth, uh, uh, I mean youth cultures, and uh, in particular, uh, in this case, uh, a golf area, and, uh, um, and then I'll go on to discuss Iran in particular after I discuss uh, a few issues about uh, the region as a whole. Um, um, all right, uh, as I said, I'm going to um, uh, try to sp speak the language of political scientists. So this is just my attempt. Um, and uh, hopefully um, um, I can show you the value of looking at um, sort of the cultural dimensions and components um, of these particular um, areas and uh, countries and um, states, uh, the value of seeing those cultural dimensions. Um, um, all right, let me start by talking about briefly about um, uh, uh, the kinds of frameworks in which we approach, in my field I approach uh, uh, these particular uh, issues. Um, we are, uh, for example, more likely to talk about uh, spatialities um, in which we have, uh, we talk about uh, geocultural markets. Um, um, I guess you can, uh, uh, in this case, call them uh, some form of regionalization. Um, but more accurate would be to talk about linguistic and cultural markets because then we're now onto um, uh, units of analysis uh, or, or kinds of analysis where we're now um, freed of uh, constraints of um, uh, geography. Um, so um, then we could bring in, uh, say, diasporic you know, cultures uh, and their relationship to the homeland, so expats' relationship to homelands, um, and their contribution to the cultures that would be across, I mean, stretch across continents. And uh, so, for example, uh, the Persian language uh, popular music um, uh, is stretched you know, from all the way from Los Angeles uh, to Tehran and uh, goes through many other uh, uh, places such as Dubai, for example, or uh, Paris and London, and uh, 
more uh, increasingly Sweden. Um, we also are more likely to talk about cultural proximity, um, meaning that um, uh, people uh, uh, or, or the appeal of cultural products uh, based on shared language, religion, history, and how um, um, across um, vast dis distances there is um, 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 culture producers who produce uh, products that um, um, tend to introduce uh, often hybridized form, forms of uh, cultural forms. Um, so that, again, is something that uh, might be of uh, interest uh, to um, uh, my colleagues here. Uh, we tend to talk of, uh, uh, I think you're probably familiar with this one, globalization, um, and it could take different forms of it, uh, uh, hybridity, for example, or uh, sometimes creative adaptation, and uh, in the language of um, uh, uh, CEOs and others uh, who dabble in cultural uh, products and services, um, customization, uh, they, they like to talk about that. Um, so with that as a sort of a, a larger framework, um, uh, let me also say uh, a few things about um, why it is important, you know, in my, in my field, why we uh, think a, a cultural approach, um, a cultural understanding of politics. But by cultural, I don't mean the way usually political scientists understand it. Um, I'm talking about popular culture, the way say, fields uh, um, such as, say, literary criticism, for example, would understand culture um, and cultural studies, for example, a whole way of life. Um, now, um, this is where we are interested in uh, looking at the, the relationship between the social and the political, but vis-a-vis -vis the popular cultural forms. Um, uh, in places where formal political parties either don't exist or they don't have that kind of, you know, uh, power, uh, these cultural forms uh, become very important. Um, I mean, in this country, uh, I teach in, in a department where um, uh, my students are from the Midwest, um, and uh, they have very little relationship to politics in the formal sense. Uh, when you talk to them, they ha they're not interested. Uh, in fact, in the language of uh, formal politics to them, you know, for example, civic engagement uh, of the kind that, formal, that political scientists talk about, um, it's rather strange, you know, uh, to them. Um, uh, however, they are engaged in politics. Um, so when I show them, for example, I teach a whole class on uh, late night comedy shows um, and uh, uh, in terms of citizenship. So um, we're more likely there to talk about uh, these kinds of cultural forms as forms for citizenship. Uh, in some literature, we talk about monitorial citizenship, meaning uh, citizens, you know, th this is a case where individuals monitor, like spectators, you know, uh, they monitor politics as opposed to being engaged uh, formally. Um, they also tend to like talk about, we tend to talk about media citizenship and cultural citizenship. Uh, in most of these cases, um, we, wanna, we want to tap into um, uh, the understanding of the relationship between the governed and the governor and how day-to-day -day people experience it outside formal politics. Um, so on that note, for example, Iran is a very interesting place to study. Um, so um, let me um, uh, briefly talk about um, what that would mean in, say, you know, uh, in terms of uh, the Gulf area. Um, so talk, speaking of a, sort of a regional dynamics, or we can call it transnational uh, dynamics, um, here, uh, apart from, so at one time we had uh, Beirut and uh, sort of Egypt, uh, Cairo, uh, and, and uh, say as cultural you know, production centers of, you know, for uh, a larger uh, pan-Arab audience. Um, and, uh, but at some point, um, we, um, we, we saw an explosion of um, other forms of uh, media uh, um, from uh, specifically uh, the Gulf area. Um, so, um, although I won't talk about this in, in any length here, but think about uh, how Al Jazeera at one point uh, presented sort of a particular uh, sort of a face of, um, uh, well, 
um, Al Jazeera was born out of the need after the first Gulf War uh, for a so-called Arab voice, um, because CNN was uh, the only thing that you heard, uh, the American accent, as we say in the news business. And um, of course, Al Jazeera at some point had to be challenged from within the Arab and sort of, you know, uh, uh, public sphere, and that gave rise to Al Arabiya. Um, now, the um, relationship here is it's itself very interesting in that um, uh, Al Arabiya was launched by a group of uh, uh, Saudi um, uh, 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 businessmen, politicians, uh, with ties to other uh, um, political centers in the, air, in, in the area, but based in uh, Dubai, and it seeks to sort of present an alternative to Al Jazeera. Um, so this kinds of, you know, um, by the way, President Obama, the first inter formal interview he gave was to Al Arabiya. Um, now, um, looking at these two outlets uh, in terms of popular imagination and what they project uh, as, you know, sort of uh, the voice of the Arab so-called streets, uh, those would be a, a va vastly different. Uh, so that differentiation itself, um, by the way, if, we, if I don't get to it, um, uh, um, I will probably <laughs> miss it. But uh, let's say up front that if I were, to, uh, have to, if I had time to uh, discuss those questions of uh, experience of modernity these days, you know, in in in, in that part of the world, uh, uh, some axes, you know, would have to be addressed. Uh, for example, the experience of private versus public domains. Uh, um, for example, question of um, uh, difference. You know, the uh, question of reflexivity, uh, question of um, the place of religion and faith and reason, you know, and state, all these things that are being experienced in a sort of new way, uh, and partly uh, in my field at least, we attribute them to the proliferation of new communication and media you know, technologies. And, uh, um, uh, but I, I doubt that I'm going to get to, to, all, to all that. Uh, but uh, for, for one minute now, I'm going to sort of address this um, one particular cultural f uh, format or cultural form uh, that has been very popular. Um, and in a, uh, this is uh, reality television, uh, which has been sort of um, all the rage in the US and in Western Europe uh, and everywhere else for that matter. Um, of course, uh, this particular genre was adopted in um, uh, various uh, uh, countries. And within the uh, Arabic-speaking um, um, world, uh, there were three of these. And one of my colleagues has written a whole book on this. Um, uh, there were three shows. I mean, there, was, uh, there were many shows. But there were, at the beginning of these, uh, there were particular the, the three shows, one was called Big Brother, uh, one Star Academy, and the, uh, the other one was, uh, I think it's called Superstar. And um, these were highly controversial. Um, it led um, uh, the, to the issue of fatwas in Saudi Arabia, a parliamentary deba debate in, in Bahrain, in Kuwait. People were threatened to go to jail. Um, and um, on just one issue of gender, for example, and uh, the meaning of uh, separation of you know, sort of private uh, and the public, uh, and um, on that, um, all kinds of issues were discussed um, um, in a very contentious way, uh, out in the open, uh, on these television shows, uh, call-in shows. Um, and so in some ways, uh, uh, these forms of uh, popular culture uh, provides forums that would otherwise not uh, be uh, available to audiences. And so this all matters of, you know, co concern to public life were being debated. Um, so if we put that um, uh, in this framework, um, let us say what, what are the, uh, this, what are the, um, you know, these the, uh, uh, variables that political scientists talk about formal politics, you know, uh, participating in debates, you know, voting, um, articulating, you know, some passion and feelings. Um, um, all of these things are experienced in a different form. Um, 
it probably is the closest thing that the large portion of youth cultures, anyway, uh, where experience real democracy. Because you get to call in and vote off the island someone you don't like or support someone you like. By the way, uh, many of the uh, politicians themselves have been getting in on these things, you know. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, move uh, faster a little bit here. Um, um, all right. In, um, there's a connection now. Uh, let, me get, let, me get, let me get closer to my own area of uh, uh, recent uh, research that I've been doing um, on uh, popular culture in Iran. Um, 30 years of Islamization projects by the state um, in Iran have uh, largely failed um, if you look at the popular culture in Iran. It's a fairly secular popular culture. Um, so um, we have, if I get to it, I'll show you the official uh, sort of culture. Um, and then there's the stuff that people do and live. Um, it's not to say there aren't uh, popular religious you know, uh, culture forms. Uh, there are. Um, but by and large, um, um, if, say, you, you travel to Iran, and that's, that's part of my research, uh, you go talk to young people, do ethnography about, you know, how they spend their leisure time. Uh, what do they do? What are they, you know, affectively, you know, invested in? Um, well, quite a bit of it is basically uh, stuff that they partake of global youth cultures, you know. So, for example, rap music in Iran is all the rage right now with all these, you know, uh, anybody under 23 uh, has no, well, maybe even, you know, um, a little older, they have no taste for stuff that comes out of L.A., uh, you know, who killed the L.A. pop star, and the ground music in Iran. Uh, L.A. pop star, I mean the pop stars for Iranians. Um, um, and so now we have this uh, very uh, thriving underground culture in Iran. Uh, the connection to Dubai would be that uh, for a while rappers would, uh, a lot of uh, rappers have their own recording studios, makeshift, you know, their home stu recording studios. Uh, they use internet file sharing to distribute content. They even actually sometimes set up accounts where you have to deposit money to get you know, uh, uh, the podcast or, or the copy of the CD. Um, there are kinds of, there's a whole informal economy, I think economists call it, you know, uh, where um, uh, a lot of um, 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 activities take place that would be outside of the official uh, sort of culture and official economy. I don't have, uh, okay, I'm gonna try to see if I can show you this very quickly. I may need uh, audio, okay, I'll get it. Uh, all right, all right. Um, actually, uh, that's not what I want to show you, but okay, now that's on. Um, this is, um, um, it, the way Chuck D, if you know who Chuck D is, um, All right, I don't want to show you that. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's going to take, take a while. Um, uh, in, uh, let's put it this way. Um, um, the, um, the recent events in Iran, um, thank you, uh, have pointed us to the people outside Iran that there are actually you know, multiple Irans. And uh, some of them are now at odds, at odds with each other, and that's why you have the current you know, crisis we have. But you can talk about that, about the crisis of cohesion of the elites at the top. That's the language of political scientists, you know. Um, and uh, I, at, the, at the cultural level, uh, so this official uh, comes into conflict with unofficial uh, popular culture. Um, these are not part of um, I wanted to show you. Uh, forgive me as I uh, fly through these. Um, that I have a list of contradictions in the Iranian sort of political system. Um, and, uh, and in fact, a society where I sort of discuss um, how the current crisis and uh, sort of popular culture provides a space in which these things can be negotiated and, and lived. Um, and um, Iran as a, a sort of a very information rich environment, I'm going to skip over these uh, two. Uh, suffice it to say that the current crisis in Iran partly is about definition of what is, uh, what is um, pro you know, media. Uh, what is public sphere and what, what's legitimate and what's illegitimate in the forms of expression. Um, so again, these, all these uh, uh, tensions exist between what's at the official level, what's at the unofficial level. And um, uh, I'm going to show you, uh, this, this image 
uh, or this collage here uh, demonstrates uh, what I'm trying to uh, say to you. Um, uh, in the background, of course, we have the Friday prayers. Uh, the most they can muster of people to go to this thing would be, I don't know, a couple hundred, you know, uh, no, I don't know, uh, 30,000. Say on, on a day, uh, if the government, you know, didn't really bust people in, uh, say at most uh, they could muster, you know, like a couple hundred thousand maybe. But I bet if they have, uh, a, you know, some pop star go to Iran and the government really didn't, you know, like get in and prevent people from attending, um, I think, you know, we probably have a, a much uh, um, a wider participation. So um, now, this is what I really, where my area of research is uh, currently. And um, um, I, my, my argument in some of my work is that uh, uh, we have the official media, uh, official culture in the organs, Islamic Republic, you know, sort of broadcasting. Um, and then we have all these other media. Um, and that would be communication technologies, recent co communication technologies. Um, where they allow people uh, to challenge the discourse of the state. And uh, they, these are the sorts of things that cannot, that easily, they cannot be uh, uh, contained. And so here are two couple of examples of images. I have all these files, uh, video files, off of people's cell phones that I've collected. I have thousands of them. Um, but this couple of it, just images. On the top, uh, of course, it's an image of a, you know, uh, uh, the Supreme Leader. Um, it doesn't matter if it's photoshopped or not. Uh, it gets circulated among young people as, it, as the thing. Probably older people don't, you know, they, their gesture wouldn't mean anything to them, but, it, but younger people know what it means. Um, uh, the, the one at the bottom, I have several of these. Uh, these young women are standing underneath this sign uh, that says, you know, dear sister, um, you know, uh, observing her job, you know, uh, is not restriction. Um, of course, they all took their you know scarves off so that they could take a picture and, and you know stick it to the man. If you were if I was talk, if I were to talk about or speak the language of the popular culture in uh, in, uh, in 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 this country. Um, all right, um, and uh, wrapping this up, um, the question of you know um, relationship to uh, a, a structure um, uh, in Iran. Um, I just want to read this by a French philosopher. Uh, where he said the circulation of representation by preachers, you can substitute mullahs, um, uh, tells us nothing about what it is for its users. And um, this is a question of you know, popular culture users, uh, or in other languages, you know, cons consumers, they make do. Um, this is consumption. Consumption is a secondary production, and making is a creative act. And um, we're talking about here arts of making, ways of operating practices through which users reappropriate space organized uh, by the dominant order. Um, so um, uh, in, uh, in, this, in, in a book that I recently had uh, on uh, Iran, I discuss uh, sort of the culture policies of the past 30 years, and it maps out onto something like this, you know, and I make an argument uh, basically that uh, at key moments in, in this 30-year uh, history, uh, culture policies, decisions by, you know, um, uh, uh, policymakers have uh, been consequential, and what we're saying today, uh, to a large measure, uh, the results of those decisions that we made in the past, and of course the, the demographic realities about you know in a country where 30 percent, I mean 70 percent of the population is under the age of 30, uh, uh, highly literate, urbanized um, student uh, population. Uh, every year uh, we have more and more students, uh, where uh, women's participation. Right now, more women graduate from college in Iran than men do. Um, and all that means uh, no, we are headed uh, for more of the same if the current sort of political system doesn't allow room uh, uh, for change. That's where I'm going to stop. Thank you very much. I'm going to be very traditional. We need none of these things. <laughs> By definition, less interesting. Uh, just before I start, thank you, Richard Norton, Adal Najm, and one of the three amigos, Ali Banu Azizi, and Theresa, please, all the work that you did, we really appreciate it. Uh, my topic is citizenship and rights. And I'm probably going to be more theoretical than I should be in this regard. 
I want to give an overview of this concept, which I think is very significant uh, for the Middle East, but especially for the Gulf area. I'm going to briefly go through its um, uh, critical historical periods from the Greeks uh, to T.H. Marshall to John Rawls, and then the Islamic world, and finally something about the Gulf. I hope to do that in 15 minutes. <laughs> I'll try. Uh, the origin of the concept of citizenship really goes back to the Greeks. And in Aristotle's book, treatise called Politics, he viewed the citizen, quote, as a person who both shares in the government and also submits to be governed, unquote. In other words, the concept for Aristotle had two dimensions, legal and social. The legal aspect in the classical Greek city-state involved emancipation and liberation from primordial sentiments. And the social aspect was fusion in what Aristotle referred to as voluntary civic community. Now, my point here is that in spite of this beautiful wording and beautiful concepts, even in Aristotle, we have a problem with the definition of citizenship that applies to the modern time. Aristotle thought that a virtuous life involves acceptance of the other. But the other was defined, excluded two groups, slaves and women. So from the very beginning, the concept of citizenship also involved exclusion of some groups within the social order. Then going way, way back to 19, late 1940s, the British scholar T.H. Marshall wrote a very important book on citizenship that has become in some ways the modern academic uh, topic uh, of, 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 of that issue. He thought in his book that there are three components to citizenship, civil, political, and social. C uh, uh, civic is search for individual rights. Political is political participation. And social is economic welfare. What was interesting, from, at least from my perspective, about Marshall, that he was a di had a dynamism in his analysis, that social orders, societies, can move from one to the other until ultimately they can exercise full suffrage, equality before the law, and the opportunity of equality in politics. So in many respects, Marshall's reformulation of Aristotle with somewhat exclusion of that element has become the basis for much of a debate in the modern time. Let me jump up again and mention something about the great philosopher John Rawls. His theory of justice and liberal individualism associates justice Hence, in my view, citizenship as fairness. Justice as fairness, in Rawls' view, maintains that the central concept of individual rights is an essential element. But there's also a public sphere with which that is connected. In other words, Rawls connects individual liberty both in terms of rights before the law as well as justice in the social order. And I think in some ways this is the most dramatic, the most uh, exceptional definition of justice that many of us at least adhere to, including myself. What about the Islamic world? The notion of citizenship in Islam is somewhat new. It really came to the Islamic world in 19th century and later from Europe. And it, it had a very different orientation in the Islamic civilization, people were identified as groups and were given certain rights for that. And as such, there were certain obligations that groups were required to do before the social order. In other words, there was a connection here in Islamic law between citizens and the state. The connection between the two was viewed to be vibrant and vital and the emphasis was the main maintenance and continuation of Islamic community. In other words, one can ask modern questions, whether regard to Islam, to Marshall, or to Aristotle. The key questions are, who is 
a citizen? Among citizens, who has what privileges? And third, whose norms and practices among citizens are symbolically aligned with those of the state? It combines individual liberties and, again, <coughs> social order. In the Islamic world, again, the emphasis was the two of them go together, but primacy goes to the community. Islam, as we all know, is one of the most communitarian religions in the world, where there is an emphasis on a community which is based on order. The historical fear of chaos, fetna, in Islam played some role in the way citizenship was, was defined and so forth. But categorization of people continues to the present time. From the very, very beginning, there was a categorization of the people of the book and idolaters. And idolaters were in turn categorized, I'm sorry, uh, 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 in turn categorized with different, different groupings. In other words, there were boundaries set for citizens in the Islamic world, and those boundaries remain with us to the present time. Give you another example. Uh, Islamic civil and criminal law makes distinctions, the pure version of it, along the sides of, of gender. Furthermore, minors and those who are mentally handicapped have different sets of obligations and rights in the social order. Again, despite of all these differences, the idea of a community, the idea of Ummah is transcendent in Islamic civilization. Well, what about the Gulf? Of course, Islam has had a long civilization with many changes and so forth, but certain ideas have remained, including the idea of the community. In the Gulf, the issue that is very important is really the notion of inclusion and exclusion. I'm not just talking about GCC. I'm talking about the Gulf in general terms, including Iran and, and Iraq. In other words, is the citizenship defined in a structural fashion, or is it defined conditionally? Is it inclusion, exclusion, and so forth? And here we have both versions of it, both ex structural exclusion of people as citizens, as well as conditional granting of citizenship to certain groups. Again, to give you some examples, Iran, of course, the Baha'is, the, uh, the, the important religious group, are excluded structurally from being a citizen. It doesn't matter. They're excluded by law and excluded in, in social practice. There may be other people who are denied citizenship, but for most other people, it's conditional. You're given the right away if you don't do certain things. When you get to the Arab side of the Gulf, the problem also remains of structural and conditional citizenship. As we discuss, although the word was in use, in Kuwait, we have a lot of people, I mean, Judith knows the numbers much better than I do, who are known as Bedouins, who live there for many, many long time, but they do not have citizenship rights. In much of the GCC, uh, you see a huge number of South Asians, Filipinos, and Palestinians as well, who do not have formal citizenship rights in those countries. They are given certain privileges. They allow certain actions, but fundamentally, their stay in these countries is conditioned by the way the state views them. While their relationship between state and society continues, but this additional factor allows the state to come in and not uh, permit the, the, the population to act in that area. We, of course, have further distinction between Shi and Sunnis and how those things come in. Uh, some of the uh, statistics that Judith shows, there are formal statistics. There are a whole bunch of other people there who do not uh, uh, fall in those neat categories and so forth. So to try to sum this up, even though the idea of a citizenship, the way we know it today, is a Western concept, it has some roots and some interaction with the Islamic version of that. And as the Islamic societies of the Gulf region have gone through major changes, the legal definition, in addition to the social definition of citizenship, has become more and more important. In my view, if history is any guide to us, this particular issue of who is a citizen, who has privileges, and how is a citizen connected to the state will become a dominant element in conflict and possibly in prosperity in that region. Only if the states of the region realize that this is an essential feature. 
Thank you very much. Let's stop. Well, uh, we'll open it up for questions from the audience. And yes. Judith, do you know of any instances um, in which a foreign national working in the Gulf, uh, probably most likely in Saudi Arabia, has been uh, involved, has been arrested for terrorist-related activities? Mm -hmm. And what's the, what's the uh, context? excluding the Yemenis for a moment, but I mean, I'm talking about maybe Pakistanis and others who are working there. Um, and what were, the, what, were the, what were the circumstances? Is this on? Hello. Yes. Um, that, that's, uh, I, um, I know that there have been some in Saudi, not Western necessarily, but we know that there are Western um, loyalists or followers of, uh, of al-Qaeda, for example, in Yemen, but that's excluded. But I haven't seen the Saudis release the identities or the nationalities, although I think they claim that most of them are non-Saudi, but I don't know. Uh, similarly, uh, in, in the other states, um, we know that they have um, you know, they, they claim it's all foreign and all outside, but I really don't know the, uh, any statistics as such. Yemen is the sort of shiny example, if you will. Um, Kuwait has also arrested some foreigners, but I, again, I'm not aware of the numbers. Uh, there's not much information, and I think, as you know, it's been a standard practice that the Americans are not allowed to know very much about who's arrested, who they are, or what their fate is. Identify. My name is Lael Adams. I'm a graduate student in IR here at BU. Um, my question is for um, you. Uh, good. <laughs> and um, you mentioned remittances um, and that there's only remittances going back and there's not too much higher level investment in, in these Asian countries. But to what extent have these remittances allowed for um, certain groups of people working in the Gulf to have economic opportunities that they wouldn't usually have if, unless they had had the chance to go to the Gulf, back in their home countries. No, no you're quite right. That's, that's the point of going to the Gulf uh, when there is no market for labor at home. And the remittances are key to uh, supporting families, um, supporting retirement. When, when, when I go home, I will have the biggest house in the village, whatever. There, I think that if, whether it's myth or reality, the remittances are very important. What we saw, for example, after, again, my, my favorite example or my only example, uh, Kuwait, when all of the Palestinians or Jordanians, whatever, um, had to go home, was a real drop in remittances that hurt the government's uh, Jordan was hurt because the money that did come home was part of the unofficial economy, never passed through government hands. But there was a real downturn because of that, uh, so that um, there is an impact. But it's not exactly, um, you know, nothing, not, nothing has really been done that's going to discourage people from wanting to go. Uh, because it's that those, that's where the jobs are, that's where the hope is. And the worry about them wanting to stay there is, I, I, don't, I don't know how serious that is either, because the idea is the money goes up. But the problem, I'll point out, is that the remittances don't start to flow for maybe a year or more, because uh, let's say a laborer from Bangladesh or wherever he or she is from, Filipino, the contractor who hires them uh, tells them that they have to uh, he's going to deduct from their wages the cost of their travel. They have to go to, if they go to an agent, there's a fee for, um, uh, for getting a job, a contract in, in the Gulf, so that there's a lot, until uh, they, till they get their hands on some money, it could be a year or two. They don't have their documents. Uh, until now, it's been uh, clear in the law that they could not change jobs. Now, that is one of the things that we're looking at that they say they're going to change. 
Um, so I think it's, uh, you know, you have to be re- determined for the longer term here, but because to realize that money is not, it's not so much in the, the very short, it doesn't, it doesn't happen your first week on the job. Hi, I'm Elaine from the Party Center. This question is for um, Professor Samati. Just wondering if there are any signs in the political system in Iran that they are aware of the underground um, popular and youth culture and they are moving to meet the youth um, in the middle so as to recognize the changes. Um, I'm I'm positive that they're aware that there is, um, you know, um, this underground culture in Iran, and I know that because all the measures they take to stop it. Uh, for example, you know, um, uh, popular music at, at one point was in Iran uh, subversive because the state wouldn't allow it. And at some point, someone decided, let's just uh, let them have their pop music. And then pop music lost all of its appeal. Um, so then that opened the door for heavy metal, rock, and rap. And uh, because the kids always have to have the, the thing that then they can have. Uh, so, um, um, but the state hasn't budged on that. There was one time when the Revolutionary Guard, uh, very quickly one afternoon, they issued a permit for some rapper to come on some stage, but very quickly they just, you know, uh, um, they dismantled it, you know. So there are um, there are inc- some signs, you know, that um, some within the upper echelons of, you know, the Iranian political system, they see the key to their survival is to let some of these, you know, uh, cultural freedoms, let them have them. Um, so, but there's, at top, there's the, you know, internal struggle. So, for example, um, I mean, during the presidential campaign of 2009, um, um, various uh, politicians, uh, including Mr. Ahmadinejad, you know, paid lip service to you know how music is important and and all that. Uh, in fact, even recently, uh, Mr. Ahmadinejad has tried to um, appeal, or at least in, in some ways, um, to diffuse you know this sort of intense dislike of him by. Um, sending signals to people that music is important and culture is important and and of course he said all these things before the first time he ran for president Um, and rappers used all those clips of him where he says you know I'm not going to bother you know young people you know about their hairstyle why would I would ever do that you know of course uh, everything got you know worse uh, once he became president so the popular musicians, uh, underground musicians, uh, turn use all of his words. In fact, there's a, on on YouTube if you you know you know search for it, Ahmadinejad's rapping, uh, and they I I have it, um, and they of course they've taken his footage uh, and they doctored it. You know, uh, it, this, it's these are his words, actual words, but they cut it, and they put to a beat. You know, and and he's rapping. Um, so they're aware of it. Uh, there are some. People within you know within the government uh, who who think that you this is you know you can't you can't stop seven percent of the population and box them in you know uh, but the group of people who are behind what's going on in Iran right now uh, are dead set against it uh, so there's conflict about that attack. Just just a very minor comment. Uh, recently, from Netflix, which you all know. I got this documentary, it was made in Iran, secreted out, and I'm sure Mehdi knows the name, escapes my mind, about these women who want to become rap singers in Iran. And it shows you not just these three, but the whole importance of rap in Iran, in a very, very similar, but in Persian, of rap culture that, that is among women and, and young men you know, all around. Do you, do you remember the name of that film? Um, well, there's several of those right now. Uh, there was there's one that I actually presented on the behalf of the filmmaker recently in Chicago, um, um, called uh, "Rapping in Tehran." Um, I suggested the name to the filmmaker because he had, you know, his English isn't very good, so he had some title. I suggested it, and um, it was recently shown. That's one of them. Uh, then there's the one um, um, by Obadi called. 
and no one knows about Persian cats or something like that, you know. Um, and there are, there are other ones. I don't know which one, um, but yeah, uh, there are quite a few of those right now. as the makeup of the expats has changed, have the rights deteriorated because now some of the cultural and religious sort of ties, say with Palestinians or Jordanians and so on that existed are no longer in place because they're Indians or Filipinos and so on. Have you seen a deterioration or is it sort of status quo? A deterioration in their rights? Yes, rights and citizenship and treatment and so on. But expats have no, none of those rights. Now, you're right, there was an exception. But, uh, for example, I think especially among the Palestinians, uh, many of whom you know, began going to the Gulf after the uh, 48 war. They went again in 67 uh, and afterwards. But I think with each one of these floods, uh, it got tougher for the Palestinians. So the first generation could come with their families, their children could live with them, and a few, a very few, uh, got citizenship, usually because they, they uh, gave extraordinary service to the emir. I think we all know uh, a couple of these. Uh, Shafi Gabra, uh, Palestinian, and he has citizenship, but uh, he gave extraordinary service to uh, Kuwait for many, many, many years. But that's the exception. And I don't know that you hear much of that. The only nationalization, if you will, that I've heard of, um, the, uh, the Badoon. Many of the Badoon have been given citizenship, even though uh, it's, it is believed by many Kuwaitis that they're Iraqi in origin and they should go home. But they've been there since before 1920, so I guess we're going to have to uh, extend. But I, I don't know. I haven't heard it. Maybe somebody else has. Can I make a comment? Please. Uh, this is not to praise what's happening, which is, I think, is, is, is really much worse than <laughs> any of us said. But if you look at the trajectory of labor in the GCC, especially in UAE and Qatar, other places, uh, there has been so much international noise made about the mistreatment, especially South Asians, in these major projects in Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and so forth, that the news has reached outside in the United Nations, International Labor Organization, New York City, and so forth. More and more uh, people are raising this as a public issue. And the claim that some of the regimes make that actually along those lines, they are moving more towards a, a kind of international standard. Uh, but whether that's true or not is a whole different question. Well, I don't know what inter international standard <laughs> uh, we're talking about. Better than Improvement what they have. Improvement <laughs> in housing, made to our raped, have the right to go to their embassy to look for shelter. Um, I don't know that the basic, oh, and probably one of the, uh, even worse, you know the 50 degree rule? If the temperature hits 50 deg degrees centigrade in the Gulf, business has to shut down. Uh, let's see, 50, is that 135? in uh, Fahrenheit, why is it, I've been over there in the summer, why is it that it never goes above 49? <laughs> you know? So I think that there's probably a very long way to go, I but uh, Farhad is correct. I think it's had probably the most impact though on importing like five to seven year old uh, Pakistani or Bangladeshi little boys to ride in the camel races. That got a lot of bad publicity. No, but. But this is not to, to uh, say anything different than Judith, yeah. but the reason I'm mentioning this is because some of the international yeah. building operations, especially in UAE, Louvre, uh, Guggenheim, and um, my own institution, there has been demands from inside those institutions that some of the labor there should be treated better <laughs> than they had been before. Yeah. But what does that mean in practice remains to be seen. That's, that's right. right. No, you're right. Dr. Banu Azizi. Yes. Camel jockeys, basically, ch camel jockeys in Pakistan who are transported to over to UAE. Uh, that's no longer the case, that's basically. Right. Uh, right. There are a strong NGO system in Pakistan, and that's very active. Yeah. So that's basically part of it. No, you're, you're right. It got a lot of international publicity, probably more than almost yes. anything else. Yes. No, you're quite right. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Yes. 
my question is uh, very much related to what was just said, and that is um, trying to connect um, the two presentations uh, by Dr. Kazemi and Dr. Yaffe. Um, it seems to me that we may be moving over the next decade or so towards an international covenant um, on citizenship and labor rights, um, which would draw from the experiences um, of, of this region. Now, obviously, that's going to be a terribly, terribly complex um, issue, uh, but it seems to me that that's where the change is going to have an impact, mm -hmm. and by the moral pressures and political pressures that will be placed on the firms that will be dealing um, with these countries. Yeah. Um, so the question there, I mean, just to elaborate on it a, a little bit more, is not only the status of the workers, but also their children and their children yeah. who have been in these countries for sometimes two or three generations and have no opportunity to become incorporated into the citizenship structure. You're, um, you're correct, but uh, those who, those expats who have their families or are permitted to have their families there are not the great mass of expats. That's a very small class. Well, respond to this is uh, in terms of the identity, as I'm sure you have heard, that in order to preserve a Bahraini identity or a Kuwaiti yeah. identity, we cannot afford to do that. Um, to which I believe the answer is, well, if the Western countries were to abide by the same uh, rules, many of us would not have been here right. uh, in this room. In fact. Correct. Um, yes, over here. I just would like to take a second to draw a connection between the previous panel and this one, which is to say that um, money and people are often not conceived in the same way. And you don't think about them in ethically coherent fashion. And specifically, thinking about Islamic economics from the previous panel with the very gross human rights abuses that have happened um, with the population in the Gulf countries. So you have uh, the coexistence of Islamic, ethically infused Islamic banking and finance, on the one hand, coexisting with a system that allows these uh, perpetuations of human rights abuses of foreign workers to coexist and, in fact, to be funded by um, structures in Islamic banking and finance for those purposes. And I guess I'm just wondering if anyone on the panel here has heard conversations trying to link these two components, hiring um, expatriates to work for substandard wages and, and living and living in terrible conditions under a system of Islamic banking that is aimed to be sort of ethically infused and working for the greater good of society. I, I just make one go quick ahead. comment. Yeah, go ahead. I think is the social class factor is not unimportant in this regard. Uh, the statistic, for example, Judith shows about Iranians. In, in Dubai, that's official, but those Iranians are citizens of Iran, go back and forth, there's half a million of them. Yeah. They're very, very wealthy. I think Ibrahim Wardar, with his presentation, with her, these, these people do not have the same kind of a problem as the underclass workers on various other projects. Most of them come from South Asia. Uh, and again, in fact, you go, you go to, uh, I, I go to Abu Dhabi frequently, you go there, your Arabic will not help you that much when you go in the market. Is is your my Persian helping with my Urdu? <laughs> because more, I mean they just know a smattering of it, and the addresses you have problem, yeah, and so it's there all over, all different levels. Yeah. Uh, I I don't know of any instances, uh, but if I think of one, I'll let you know. <laughs> go ahead. Yes. Um, questions back there. Yes. Uh, my name is Imran Kidwai. Um, I'm actually going to ask a question that uh, spans the last session and this session. So one interesting thing that has happened in Dubai over the past, say, seven, eight years is uh, the institution of private property. But I was in Dubai a couple of times in 2008, and in the press and papers there was a lot of discussion on what the residency meant and whether or not anybody buying property automatically get, got residency. And since the downfall of the 
real estate market, I think there has been a bigger concern around the lack of transparency. So not on the expatriate population that, uh, that's out working there, but my question is those who have brought in money from outside, invested in property, still don't have any rights and have been complaining, and Dubai certainly needs those people back again to prop up, if you will, the real estate market. Do you see, uh, do you have any opinions, any thoughts on uh, this class of people getting any more rights than they have today? I don't think that, they, uh, just because you can buy an apartment or a property, that's not going to give you citizenship. And I don't know that that issue would even come up. Um, as long as you can live there, you know, what, born an Iranian, you're always an Iranian. You always have that citizenship. I don't, I don't know that that's been an issue. I, one thing that, the, that I have heard a lot of is that the wealth of Dubai, its ability to build so much, and maybe the crash, uh, was all funded. A lot of it was funded with the Iranian money that came in, legally or illegally, invested in apartments and in buildings, whatever. Um, how, how can you do that when you're oil poor? This is a resource poor community. Yes. Simran got one of my questions, so <laughs> I can go with the other one then. Um, Farhad, and, and kind of connecting to what Ali bin uh, Azizi said, um, Azizi, is um, uh, the kind of citizenship that you have in the Gulf. And you went through, um, who's the famous scholar, Marshall's kind of categories. And I think it's linked to the, the economic system, right, the Rentier system. What you really had the understanding, at least in the GCC states, of citizenship was linked to the economic. So it was really an economic citizenship. And having being a citizen gives you these economic benefits. And that's really how it's perceived. And that also is why people are very careful to guard citizenship because it comes with this huge bundle of goods and benefits that other people don't get. And that's why you can't compare it to US citizenship because it's not uh, sort of the same that way. But I am curious about the other things that you mentioned and that you're playing with. Uh, one is is a question of as the political systems do open up, even if, um, as Judith Yaffe said, they're kind of superficial, but you do have you know electoral bodies now and stuff that introduces a level of political citizenship that they didn't have to manage before that can play in with the conception of citizenship so that it extends much more beyond the economics. So that's one thing I'd be curious to your opinion about. And the other is this um, broad kind of more moral categories you had um, or historical categories about what Islamic citizenship looks like. And I, I was just curious, maybe, I don't know if you're drawing from uh, things that are thought out in Iran, but in the GCC, I'm just wondering if you've seen that played out as well. Uh, have people been, or, or movements, Islamic movements, or someone operationalizing that in a way to push for reform, drawing on those uh, different ideas of the community and their role in, in citizenship? Yeah, uh, you're asking actually critical questions to which I don't have easy answers. But uh, maybe Judy can correct me, but the economic citizenship in that sense, in Marshall's view, was you know, well-being and, and being well off, and, yeah, but I don't mean it that way. I don't think that has been as much of an issue uh, in terms of rights, uh, rights, economic rights, if you came with wealth and so forth, otherwise you were an empl employee. What is really, there's the two levels. I think uh, Ali Ben as he mentioned the question of identity. Uh, you go to those areas, there are layers and layers of identity. Many of it is hidden. Uh, you go to Bahrain, and if they know where you were born from, you begin to realize how many Bahrainis have Iranian origin and still maintain Persian at home, plus Arabic, but they go as Bahrainis. Because I, when there was an election several years ago, I happened to be there, and, and the U.S. Embassy invited me to go and talk with a group of uh, a group of Shi intellectuals who refused to participate in the elections, and I couldn't believe it. I mean, all of them were essentially all speaking to me in Persian, and I was supposed to speak in English. And then you go to Qatar; it's, it's a very very similar situation. There is a new Iranian market, old Iranian market. You go there, they appear with Arabic outfit, but they have maintained their culture. And so the question of identity, which is very fluid here, which is very hard to put your finger on, is actually there. And it's, some are aware of it, some aren't, but plays in the politics of the area. And I, I stand corrected on the economic factor. I, I don't, I, I'm. No, I think Farhad is correct. You know, there's something we're not talking about. We're so polite, but I can be rude, right? Richard, <laughs> is all right if I? just want to say the obvious. 
these societies are very highly, uh, class is important, status is important, tribe is important, specialness is important, and you just don't share that by making these people who don't have your class, your status, your specialness, citizens and equal with you. You know, in a way, equality only only came into the, even the Ottoman Empire, what, in the late 19th, mid-19th century? And it was resented by many Muslims who didn't want to feel equal to those who were not the same as they. I think that there is a rigidity of thought in this area, and it is very, very difficult when so much is, it's all blood and kinship networks and why we're special, and you just don't let it, and you can't buy citizenship. Maybe with the exception of that if you have enough money, but you are also closely related to, for one reason or another, to the ruling family, that gives you special privileges. That gives you protections. I mean, let's, let's to be to be honest, we know that uh, a prince is not going to be punished for beating up on an expat uh, the way, uh, say, some other foreigner would be, or somebody who's poor. I think we've seen an example of that in uh, in Abu Dhabi. Uh, so I don't know that it's, it's money per se, but I think that there is a lot of specials. Now, if you look at Gutter, where there are only two hundred thousand out of one point. Three million people who are who are citizens. Would you want to share in the highest per capita income in the world with all of these other people all of a sudden? I think that uh, we there would be a lot of resistance. I would guess there, but just as a guess, maybe so, Ali knows. <laughs> Ali, a mistake to bring in the concept of equality into this discussion in the egalitarian sense of the term, that is in the distributive sense of the term. Yeah. I completely agree with you. That concept is alien. I think this is something which That's most right. people don't quite appreciate in Islam. That is the notion of equality in terms of the equal distribution of resources does not have that kind of appeal. Uh, That's right. However, the beauty of the concept of citizenship is that it is equality before law in terms of you know, access to the political system and, and so on and so forth, not the economic dimension of it. That's a non-starter, uh, it seems to me. If one were to, to take the notion of citizenship and, and attach it to the concept of equality. You are absolutely right, Ali, but the question of uh, equality for the law if we're talking about Sharia law, will there be equality for all under that law? There will be. Yes? yes? <laughs> but that's my point, that uh, what does that do for the uh, large expat class that's not Muslim, and for the populations in some of these countries that's not as well? But that's exactly my point. Yeah. Oh, Ali, from your lips to God's ears, yes. <laughs> the, 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 so, may I ask uh, if, um, not speaking of expats, but uh, Iranians who live in Iran, um, could, uh, you know, the, the, some have read the recent, um, uh, you know, people taken to the streets as, uh, and on, uh, on the scope that they have, uh, the, uh, you know, the, um, that presence, ha some have read it as demand for citizenship in the legal sense of the term, meaning, you know, I mean, I think uh, Hamid Dabash has uh, written about, like, civil, in terms of civil rights. Um, uh, so, not, n I mean, within Iran, um, is it possible that for, again, perhaps it's across class system, <laughs> for some citizenship has doesn't have much bearing on the economic, you know, uh, on the economic register, and has more to do with, you know, um, other things. Um, I don't want to campaign for any of the reformists <laughs> here <laughs> of uh, Mir Hossein Musavi, Musavi and that we want democracy and human rights 
under the provisions of the United Nations, that is the definitions of the United Nations of human rights. That's exactly the point. That is, there is a recognition now that, that uh, you know, uh, democracy without the protection of human rights is somewhat democracy. deficient. Yeah. And for a major political candidate, both he and Karubi talking about the conventions, the Geneva Conventions on Human Rights, that's a major step forward. Yes. Um, so since I'm holding the mic, I'm going to take a, an opportunity to ask a question. Um, this year in the U.S., we're all being bombarded about census information and fill it out and send it in. And just based on the complexity of what we're talking about here, I'm just wondering how the GCC countries, when they're asked externally to give their population, their total population, do they count the expats? Because in some cases it's a majority. And if they don't, what, what are the political considerations? I would imagine there might even be some geopolitical considerations to you know, telling the world how many people are in your country who are really there versus who you just count as citizens. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the figures that you, I think one tends to see include everybody who lives there. And sometimes they're inflated. Uh, sometimes uh, they may not be. But I think that it's probably preferable to just talking about, well, you know, we really are only 200,000 gutteries or we really are only, what, 10th uh, of how many in the Emirates? You know, 10% of the population of the Emirates is only native. But have you seen anything different? No, I, I yeah. think uh, it's, the statistics lie and often lie. Yeah. And it's not that Judith is wrong, but it depends how what, what official census data where some group are structurally excluded. Yes, there's some, and some people are fearful, as you know, sometimes they're in the U.S. So it's the, the puzzle to me, really, for all of these GCC countries and leave it, uh, Iran and Iraq out of it, is how Oman has been relatively successfully dealing with these issues, where it has a, a remarkably mixed population, ethnically, racially, any form or shape you want to discuss it. But I, uh, yeah, I, I know that about 80, 85 percent are actually actual legal citizens. But you know, the process by which they have done this, I mean, there's some explanation of Oman. It's the one that I look at in some ways as the trajectory, perhaps, that others can move towards. I, th I think there is a historical explanation to that, because I was thinking of that as well and decided not to say anything. Oman has a history as an empire, and Oman was in Africa for how long? And when they were thrown out of Zanzibar, a lot of the Zanzibari Omanis had to return to Oman. I think they dealt with this a lot earlier, and I think they dealt with it head on. I think there may have been, there were discrimination problems, if I remember correctly. But you're right, they are way ahead. But, the, you know, in many ways, Oman is not part of the Gulf. It is different. And to treat them, to lump them all together as if they're all the same, sometimes doesn't work. And I think this is one sense where it doesn't work. No, I, I agree that they're yeah. different. I mean, the whole, you know, entropo, Oman was an entropo with South Asia and so forth. But to add one more point is that they had a group Dofaris for a long time. Yes. They were fighting. Yes. And the Omani regime was supported by the Shah of Iran and the British. The more important one was the British. But they had been totally now integrated in the, in, in the system. The group that felt that they were uh, the outside group, the other variety of reasons that they, they were, they are now part and parcel. I was just there two weeks ago. <laughs> it's not just looking at it, but you can get the sense sure. that Oman is a step ahead. Yeah. Sure, there are the historical differences. Judith is right. Yeah. Uh, Professor Norton? No. Well, uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, <clears throat> Judith very kindly alluded to some of the data coming from me um, in, in the opening to your talk. And I want to say that <clears throat> I did provide Judith some data, but I couldn't have presented it without the help of my graduate assistant, right. Blake, uh, um, Blake Bruner, who helped, helped me in the fall. I couldn't have done this without the help of mine. So. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I want to ask a couple of questions. Uh, one is for uh, Mehdi Samati. You very briefly alluded to, um, well, first of all, you framed your comments by talking about how uh, the youth have um, 
have sought the sort of alternative means of cultural expression and identity. And in that context, you alluded to popular religion as well. And I remember several years ago, some of my students have heard me allude to this. I was in Tehran, and, um, and a friend of mine, a young woman, um, called me up. I was there for a meeting, and she asked me if I was free, and I said, yes, I'm, I'm free tonight, whatever. And she said, well, I wanted to take you to meet some friends. Well, I had visions of going someplace and uh, maybe hearing some of this popular music you were talking about, or rapping, or whatever, and you know, I was curious as to what kind of libations they would be serving the whole business. <laughs> so in any event, we were far out of uh, the central part of Tehran, and I don't know Tehran well enough to tell you where we went, <laughs> but uh, instead of going to any sort of musical performance, I found myself in a Sufi dhikr. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about this other track, if you will, of oppositional ident identity activities, yeah. uh, and uh, to the extent you're prepared to do so, maybe to reflect on, <coughs> on that other aspect of identity in this form, popular religion in the Gulf in general. Okay. And then on the citizenship front, um, I mean, I quite agree with Ali Ben Wazizi that uh, we're not talking here about distributional justice. We're talking here about basically fundamental rights, legal rights of individuals before the law. And I realize that one of the missing aspects of this project is any attempt to look at comparative legal remedies and so on. When I think about Kuwait, for example, with its large expatriate labor uh, pool, I'm, uh, I'm struck by how much animosity, I don't know if Kristen would agree, but how much animosity those workers feel against the Kuwaiti citizens. Yeah, probably so. And from the standpoint of the workers, it stems from the fact that they know, among other things, that if they get into a dispute with the Kuwaiti, even if uh, the Kuwaiti's um, behavior has been completely <coughs> egregious and you know unacceptable and so on, they lose. That's right. You know, you just don't you just don't even bother trying to take it in front of a judge because you're going to lose. So, uh, yeah, but let me just finish if I can ask the question. But so I wonder to what extent the panelists can talk about um, the extent to which we find gradients of, if you will, uh, individual legal rights in Gulf states, uh, and and to the extent that uh, these sort of legal remedies are are more broadly distributed in other places. How you would how you would explain that? Does it have to do with Omani experience of empire? I mean, for example, how would we look at the UAE system? Would we find uh, a somewhat more open legal system than in Kuwait or Qatar, for example? So I wonder if you would think about commenting on that. And I guess, Kristen, you want to add an addendum to that? Uh, just really quick, a, a personal experience. I was in Kuwait in '99 uh, when they had the. There was a big riot at that time by uh, Egyptian uh, expatriate workers, and it was a, a really big one. And uh, they were trashing the neighborhood where they were living and uh, burning cars and all this sort of thing. And they couldn't get it under control for like two or three days. And I, I went to see it, and I, I was really struck one by this image of these Saidis. They're all guys from Upper Egypt. Um, kind of lined up, and uh, to say that they had no no control is absolutely true. I mean, they were already being bussed immediately to the airport and being shipped to Egypt like that day. Um, but the other thing I was struck by were the the Kuwaitis um, youth who were lined up and had to be held back by police because they wanted to get in on the scrum and and beat up basically these workers. Which I was I was kind of shocked by this, you know, that there there was that much anger. Um, and why, but anyway, it's just a, a note. But one thing just to add, and I'm, I'm sorry to jump in on your panel pretty much, but I, the, the, the same um, feeling that the migrant workers have that they can't ever come up against Kuwaiti, though I think what I was trying to say about the economic thing is that Gulf citizens feel this to some extent because if they go up against the ruling family in any way, it's not like their citizenship is absolute. I mean, you can lose your jobs, I mean, because most of them are relying on state jobs. Or you can even lose your citizenship. I mean, you have an entire tribe in Qatar that had their citizenship pulled 
because of their, well, oppositional activity linked to Saudi Arabia, so. Yeah, there's a lot of issues there um, in terms of the late, first of all, is it not true, and I'll ask this, I'll put this as a question, Kristen, that most, certainly Kuwaitis, and I think it's true in most of the states, natives, nationals, are employed by the government. Very few of them are in the private sector. So the private sector, almost top to bottom, is run by or staffed by or the work is done still pretty much by expats. Now, there may be some changes. Uh, oil industry, for example, very co they're very competent people for men to run one of these sectors. But still, there's, a perv I think, a pervasiveness. You work that uh, government is the employer of first and last resort still here. Uh, I noticed the same things you noticed when I was in Kuwait, and I think I was, I was last there two years ago, and I noticed the Egyptians were finally back. And it just struck me the sense of, uh, we were in a restaurant, one of those you know West, big Western hotels, and the fear on the face of the young lady who was serving us that she might, God forbid, say or do something wrong, which would immediately have loss of job. Uh, to me, it was just that there was a more palpable, palpable? Yeah. Concern than uh, before um, about, you know, uh, their faith, the worry. I, I thought it was really striking. I think, if anything, to be candid, that I think conditions are worse there than they were before for many of the uh, these foreign workers. If I may answer um, Dr. Norton's uh, question about uh, popular religious uh, forms. Um, I... Uh, a couple of years ago, I went to Shiraz, um, and um, there was a religious ceremony. Uh, this would be what we call Nohe Khuni, and uh, you know, during Ashura and Tasso observances. Um, we've always had a, a, a dimension of these uh, uh, observances that were really rituals. So they were, you know, religious in sort of traditional, uh, as in customs and habits, you know, of um, doing things. Uh, but then there were these, uh, always these particular cultural forms that they took. Um, now, th this one that I went to recently, uh, it didn't resemble anything I had seen before. And uh, it looked like what you're describing, this, you know, this sort of Sufi uh, tradition uh, uh, of expressing themselves. Uh, as they practice uh, certain forms of religiosity. Uh, this actually looked like, um, uh, or it sounded like rave music of San Francisco. Of course, the state does not like any of these. Um, and even though these kids are, I mean, these were all young, um, what they were doing basically was in sort of, um, uh, in a sort of, um, pulsating sort of in sync sort of movement of sort of, uh, I mean, they were moving and, and making these, you know, sounds. Uh, to me, I, I did, I mean, I'm a, at first I couldn't get why the state would be so ups, you know, upset by this. Um, of course, I mean, the content might be the same content if you sort of, you know, but the form is not, is different. Of course, there's the question of, you know, uh, why, why the state is so you know, up, you know, disturbed by these things. Much the same way I have uh, lots of music. Uh, popular musicians have sang about uh, basically the same content of Rohe, you know, you know, uh, uh, but it's put to pop music. Um, and uh, if, you didn't know, if you don't know the content, you think you're listening to you know, a pop musician. Uh, and the state is rejecting all of these. Um, so the question is, you know, uh, why and what is it that they see in these things, you know? Um, and, of course, if you really look at it over, the over time, you know, their definition of, you know, uh, what it means to be, you know, a um, member of the Islamic Republic and be faithful to the, you know, codes of the revolution and all that <laughs> has become narrower and narrower. And now many things fall outside of what they consider to be, uh, you know, Islamic, properly speaking. Um, so they're rejecting uh, these, um, and, it's, and it's in different places. Um, so on, on that note, uh, you know, I, I, I have the same, you know, I had the same observations when I saw 
uh, much the same way by the way these days they are restricting Sufis you know practices uh, and they're not allowing um, uh, it's as if they are basically banning um, certain forms of religiosity they don't you know I'm, I'm talking about same codes except it's different you know manifestations in different forms I just make a very brief comment. Uh, dialogue between Richard and Kristen. My just speech says something very obvious. Justice is never absolute. In our great country here, you know, like having a good lawyer or whatever makes makes a big difference. And you know, the really super duper lawyers do all kinds of statistical analysis of the group that are going to be jurors. So that's never absolute. We all know that. But there is a difference between, of course, legal principles and practice. And I think in Golf area, we have problem with both, both the essential legal principles and this is practice. But all of this, I think, is aided by the dramatic rise in the power of the state in that region. And if you are connected to the state in any form or shape, and there's not much of a distinction between privy and public purse, anyhow, so you're connected to the state by definition, you have tremendous amount of power and authority in your favor. And that's, I think, the real problem I take in this area. Okay, I, uh, if I could just uh, take my, <laughs> since I'm, I'm here, um, ask a few questions, um, take the prerogative here. <clears throat> I, um, first of all, I was, I was thinking that we've been talking a lot about the impact of the ex expatriate workers um, on these societies, but also another way to look at it is what they take back with them from these societies. And in terms of transnational currents, clearly that's one um, key feature of this. And I, don't, I know that in, in some respects, in some of these societies, um, there has been an explicit recognition um, that, uh, you know, an effort to see themselves as cultural centers of Islam in particular, where migrant workers, returning migrant workers to South Asia may actually transmit different models of Islam. Um, and in Bangladesh, where, where I do research, um, certainly you, you, know, you see evidence of this in a variety of respects. Um, you can often tell when someone has returned from the Gulf states by the way they dress, and this is not always the case, uh, by the kinds of clothing they adopt, and also their sort of particular um, Practices or ways of uh, ways of interpreting Islam. So that's that was one thought. Um, the other one is that um, how these ex expatriate workers, migrant workers, are kind of shaping notions of national identity um, in these societies, and uh, in, in some ways crystal crystallizing notions of cultural citizenship and national identity. And part of the context from which I'm speaking is once again I. Uh, you know, my research, part of my research has been on workers from Bangladesh in the Gulf states. And, um, you know, I'm, I, I've been taken aback by kind of um, the depth of sort of what I would describe as kind of racialization of these workers. And uh, just going through this uh, testimonies in the Kuwaiti parliament and Bahraini parliament the other day, um, you know, and here, of course, you have to keep in mind that even in terms of scale of pay, um, it's differentiated by nationality oftentimes in a lot of workplaces. So at least informally, one hears that Bangladeshis are the lowest paid, um, the most stigmatized. Um, uh, and, you know, what I'm talking about is the depth of stigma is just very, very profound. Um, so... Uh, and you know, sort of to give sort of uh, yeah yeah I don't want to get into too many details of it, but references basically to another class of human being, uh, and, and di differentiating also among migrant workers. Um, and third, very quickly, I was curious, and I haven't been able to find uh, sort of clear information on this, is that um, in terms of citizenship, uh, I've been told by a friend from the Emirates that. If one is a woman, one loses one's citizenship by marrying outside uh, a non-Emirates man. Um, but men, of course, can marry women who bring the citizenship in. And there was some, actually, some talk of change. On religious that basis? Is, no, it's a religion is a different story. No, on no, the basis of, of Emirati versus Emirati. Emirati. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So there, there are some moves to try to change that, and I can't remember which one, but but in some of the states 
women will now retain is that Oman is one, I think. I don't know who the others, if there are others, can retain their citizenship if they marry a foreigner, but not, not all of them. But that's very recent that that change has come. Sorry, there are other questions from the audience. <laughs> Since um, since late 2008, uh, the Indian government has had a much higher profile in the Gulf yes. strategically. Absolutely. And I'm thinking about the agreement that was signed in Qatar and, and, and so on. I wonder, is there any evidence of any of the South Asian governments taking um, an interest in their national workers as a group? I mean, for example, if I think of the Filipino uh, embassies, they're basically service institutions. They don't really do very much on behalf of Filipino workers. You know, you go there and you get your, you get your passport or whatever you do, but they don't, they don't really do very much on a representational level for the workers. But I wonder, do you know, for instance, if the Indians who obviously have a strategic salience that some of these other countries don't have, have been successful in having any kind of elevation of respect for rights for Indian workers who constitute a gigantic number, right over three million, if I'm not mistaken. Wasn't that triggered, though, by a, uh, a huge scandal over either, maybe it was murder or abuse of some Indian maids that were working in uh, either Saudi or one of the? Yeah. I mean, I think what triggered the change in India, and it's beginning to at least seem to assert a more protective role and a more responsible role, uh, but had to do with a scandal on how the uh, Indian women working in uh, the house were treated as virtual slaves and were, not, uh, were very badly abused. I think that's what triggered that. I, I know with the Bangladeshi government, that's been as since remittances are the the primary source of foreign exchange for the country, that that's been, um, foreign workers have been an important lobbying group. And um, for example, the change that um, you were referring to that um, Saudi Arabia moving away from the kafala, you know, the sponsorship system, um, that the Bangladesh government, you know, was uh, pushed very heavily for that. So I think that has, especially since, you know, since the remittances are, are the primary source of foreign exchange, there's been more effort. I don't know how far the Saudis have moved, but the Kuwaitis are moving away from that, the, the old sponsorship. Saudis have they've that promised. Too. Ah, yeah. of course. I think I can uh, try to answer part of the question um, that uh, Professor Norton raised. Um, in fact, I was in Bahrain uh, at the end of 2008, um, and uh, we had a meeting about this issue uh, with the labor minister, and there was um, a, a very high official from India who was furious about the treatment um, of the Indian uh, expats there. And he said that he was taking up um, the matter with um, the Bahraini government um, and making essentially the same kinds of uh, uh, pleas um, that uh, more than please, really, objections. Um, and I think India will acquire that kind of um, bargaining power. Because um, remember that uh, there's a very high proportion of professionals um, in both Kuwait uh, and Bahrain, the two um, places that I know a little bit more about, um, of, of Indians. Other questions? I'm sorry. I mean, you had your hand up for a while. I commented it was along the lines of what uh, okay. do the expats take back? Yes. So. Okay. No. Uh, behind you, the, did you? Um, yeah. It's kind of past, but um, I, I wanted to echo kind of thinking about national identity and kind of an economic package that comes with that, because I think it is a factor you have to consider. Now, um, you can look at uh, some of these instances and say. Um, when people are granted conditionally citizenship, they don't get this package. Um, uh, so trying to understand what the difference is. Um, but, but 
layering kind of on top of that, what this really means is, can we think about how tribalism as well, you brought this up in, in your talk, and maybe a resurgence of it. Um, I appreciated the historical and kind of theoretical approach, um, Dr. Uh, um, Kazumi. I, I just wonder, is it really Sharia that we should be looking at uh, for notions of citizenship in the Gulf or tribalism? Um, because there's tensions even between Sharia and tribalism. And I, and, and I think if we thought about tribalism a little bit more and what happens when it becomes a government or a state uh, for these issues of identity and, uh, and sponsorship and patronage as well. I, I think in my view, correct and simple answer is both, all of the above. They all go together, <laughs> they reinforce each other. But uh, the problem with trying to change some of the Islamic laws of, of uh, personal status laws, uh, a lot of people start opposing it because as if people who are asking for revisions are fundamentally undermining their religion. That always becomes an issue in that situation. Tribalism maybe in the long run would be an easier way to deal with that issue, but I think they reinforce each other. I mentioned the Andrew Ruth's book uh, about, about the UAE and the, the marriages, tribal structures. They come in at certain time when critical decisions, I don't mean war and peace, but you know, personal decisions, do, 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 do affect it. Uh, but I, you know, it's a very good question. I don't have a very good answer to it, but I, I, I think both have to be dealt with in, in some fashion, but gradually, you can't do it overnight. It seems to me there's, a, there's another question underlying that. Uh, which Sharia or which law system are we talking about? Uh, what is an Islamic state? Is it Pakistan? Is it Saudi? Is it Iran? Uh, they all have different practices. Iran allows Jews and Christians uh, to participate in government because that's what it says in Quran. Uh, but could you imagine that in one of the other so-called uh, Islamic states? I mean, there, there are differences uh, among them. I don't think there is any agreement. I sometimes wonder if it's not that the solution is not in the end that they'll come back to is the old uh, the old Ottoman system, you know, you have a millet system and each community is governed according to its uh, creed. Otherwise, what are you going to do in some of these societies? The Saudis are not going to be able to impose, or maybe they will, uh, Wahhabi, they, they do impose Wahhabi law, but um, I, I, I don't know, that there, there is no standard is what I'm trying to say, even among these different Islamic states. Exactly in that sense. Yeah. It's not Sharia in that uh, in kind of just one monolithic thing, but yeah. how does right. tribalism really influence the way people are identified as citizens or not? Uh, and and yeah. the fact that someone is subhuman is also because he's not in the not in the sense of a, of a tribe. Why, why should we even care about them? Uh, so I, I mean, it, it's not as black and white as that. But I, no, I, but that's I wanted to sidestep the Sharia talk a bit and, and yeah. kind of think about a state as this very large tribe. See, you're doing a very fabulous job of dealing with the issue analytically. And you can separate some of this analytically very, very well. But I think, in my view, some of those reinforce each other, even the sources may be very, very different. If I was asked this question by a bright graduate student in a seminar, I would hide in a political science jargon. <laughs> so all society, everybody goes for power, uh, status, and wealth. And there are different avenues to it, whether it's tribalism, religion, and so forth. But this is ultimately, in some way, it's not exactly incorrect, but there are different ways of reaching that. So I, I think tribalism in the Gulf and, and religious uh, identity, they, they, wouldn't you agree with it? They reinforce yeah. each other? Yeah, I do very much agree. I, don't think, I think if you ask a lot of uh, people from the region, they won't know the difference. Um, they will think that everything that was ingrained as tribal practices in Islam uh, and everything in Islam is in tribal. They don't. I don't think that many people see the distinction. But the other thing I was thinking. I think one place where we do have a model is Kuwait, with its elections and tribal Kuwaitis represent a block. Do they not? Tribal Kuwaitis and uh, the Islamists have banded together because they have a certain common goal in mind. Sure, they're against <coughs> women, but why, for example? Why are they against reform or change? Because their real goal is to put, at least my interpretation, is to put restrictions on the Sabah family. 
And how you go about that is something that we're seeing in our own arcane politics. How do you constrain the power of the, of the president, uh, you know, in unpleasant ways? But I, but I think there's a lot of different kinds of arguments coming to play here because the goals are, is it identity? Is it something which is more, more uh, deeply in terms of changing the system separate from the identity issue? I want to make a quick uh, uh, comment on yes. this, just very, very brief, very quick. Sorry. Uh, the issue of tribalism becomes so much more important and tribes in the Gulf area. But you look at the three largest Muslim countries of the Middle East, Egypt, Turkey, and Iran. Tribes are insignificant. They mean nothing. But yet some of those issues come up that one can call tribalism, you know, still. So that's why I think the issue is very conflated. Okay. If I can comment on Muhammad, the concept of citizenship is basically based on Muslim Ummah. The, uh, we don't rely on the state, basically. We rely as a religion. We take it as a religion, as a Muslim community. So it's the Muslim Ummah that dignifies it as a citizenship. If you read Pan-Islamism and get to know about it, then that's about it. Professor said, as human beings. So I, I, I understand it's, it's conflated, but that's also a difficult, uh, difficult thing to see on the ground. This is very sharp. Well, okay, I'm sure. Okay, well, um, I, I think we've come to an end, and thank you very much to the panelists for a wonderful, wonderful panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.